So according to my watch, it's five past. Are we ready to uh, for the next session or do we need a minute longer? I think we're ready. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So I'd like to continue now with the younger stages of Tenerife. And um, this is in particular the Las Canadas volcano. And then of course also the uh, currently active system, Tate and its rift zones. There is a NASA image here, a satellite image, and you can actually see uh, Tate in the foreground and Pico Viejo. Pico Viejo means the old vent, but actually it's kind of more a parasite vent sitting on the side of Tater. So in fact, it's, it's largely younger than Tater. But uh, what's important here is you see the caldera margin of the Las Canadas caldera. And this is uh, a collapsed basin. And we shall talk a little bit about how it might have collapsed. Um, but there you see the stratigraphy of the old Las Canadas volcano, which was a big volcano. And it was rather explosive. And uh, the best exposures of this explosive record are in the caldera walls themselves and also in the southern parts of the island, in what's known as the Bandas del Sur, the southern strips. And I think the name comes from the fact that there's these stripy layers that you would see when you pass the rocks. And here's some impressions. And uh, the image in the lower right is the El Abrigo Egnumbride, one of the younger ones of the Bandas del Sur succession. And then there are several other ones, the Grandilla Egnumbride probably being the biggest one. And uh, there is all sorts of uh, features that we associate with Plinian eruptions. And for example, there's valley fills like uh, the ones in the top left of the image. There we see a little erosional valley that was filled by Egnumbrides and they would even out the topography typical for these debris, uh, sorry, for these glowing avalanche deposits. And uh, they're not uh, strictly uh, uh, valley con constrained, they're actually covering the areas in large blankets and they even out topography on a large scale. So if you were uh, alive back then, um, this would have been quite serious. But I guess uh, there was no humans at that time on the island. And uh, therefore, there is no record in terms of human casualties, but there's some fossils between some of the big ignimbrites. So some of the uh, uh, biotic life was, was suffering at the time. And uh, here's a few more impressions. The Grandilla ignimbrite, the largest of them in um, the uh, top right. And it's quite a massive pumice rich deposit. So this must have been a really strong eruption. And uh, it's got this typical secession for Plinian eruptions. It has a pumice rich deposits at the base, some airfall as well, and then a more fine grained material. It's not particularly welded. Some of the ignimbrites are welded, meaning they were super hot when they came down. And uh, they were really covering large areas of the island with these thick pumice deposits. The um, erosion of some of these pumice rich deposits gives rise to very spectacular landscapes and uh, here is uh, one of these outcrops that looks like, I don't know, Martian or lunar landscapes. And uh, this is very kind of um, popular with tourists. And uh, if you have big uh, uh, lithic clasts, foreign clasts in there, they might prevent erosion of some of these um, columnar features there. And um, then you get these uh, sticking out fingers that uh, have uh, escaped erosion so far. But ultimately, of course, they will erode as well. So then uh, we need to think a little better about where do these big ignimbrites come from? And as I said, we have these records in the caldera wall and uh, many of the ignimbrites can be traced from the caldera wall down to the uh, Bandas del Sur to these southern outcrops. And there's uh, good evidence that uh, it's the area of the present day Las Canadas caldera that was the source region for these big ignimbrites. And um, there's discussion about how the um, um, how the oops this shouldn't be there anyway how the uh, caldera formed and um, partly the argument is there was vertical collapse uh, like in a, um, a collapsed caldera another argument is that there was lateral collapse and headwall erosion and there's certainly erosion and this is why we can actually look a little bit into the Las Canadas volcano and what we see there. And in this rugged area in the caldera margin, we see intrusions and they are partly eroded out. This is why we see them. 
And uh, this gives us a sense that the intrusive center of the Las Canadas volcano was around the area where today's Las Canadas caldera is located. But the volcano, the, the center of the Las Canadas volcano is gone. Now, what do we have left in terms of evidence there? Well, there is intrusive materials that we have just outside the caldera. Here, uh, some of the sombreros, as they are locally known, these are um, um, sill intrusions, and they get eroded out, and then they look like, um, like hats uh, because of the erosion patterns, hence the name sombrero. And um, this is giving us an idea about the intensity of the volcanic activity there, loads of these intrusions. And in the caldera margin, we also have a, a lot of dikes and uh, plugs and sheets. And here we have some inward dipping dikes. These would be cone sheets, if you will. And then there's also some outward dipping ones that might be more like ring dikes. And uh, this gives us a sense for uh, a very active central volcanic system. And uh, we have these uh, dike arrangements, cone sheets, as well as ring dikes. And to the left here, we see some of the outward dipping uh, ones and also the cone sheet, the inward dipping ones. And there we have them at a place called Boca Tause, just at the margin of the caldera. And uh, this is beautifully exposed. So this caldera wall was certainly eroded. It's not the original collapse, whether it was a vertical collapse or a lateral collapse, that's a slightly different discussion, but it's not the original collapse scar. We must be quite aware of that. And beautiful for us, because of this headwall erosion, um, we can see a little bit more about how this Las Canadas volcano was working inside. And we also see some lava tubes that got filled. And here's some um, a radial pattern of a lava tube fill. So there was, uh, um, features like um, um, lava levees that uh, grew over and lava was transported inside. But we also have these plugs and here's a big funnel-like plug inside the Las Canadas caldera. It's locally known as the cathedral because it's uh, so huge and um, it's got this beautiful columnar jointing. But because it's an intrusion, the columns actually lie uh, flat, they are horizontal, not vertical like uh, we often find in uh, surface lavas. And uh, by the way, um, you can probably not see it, but there is a person at the base of this thing. Uh, it's so small that uh, you can barely see the person. It's a huge feature and it sticks out quite prominently. So here's a reconstruction of the Las Canadas volcano. And uh, it's believed that uh, the Las Canadas volcano must have been as high as Teide is today, but it likely filled the entire area of the present day Las Canadas caldera. How do we know that? Well, it's because of the valleys that have been incised. If you were to project them upwards and the strata that's exposed in the caldera margin, if you just take it uh, laterally upwards, you actually have the meat somewhere a little off to the east of the present day Teide volcano. So this was likely a big volcano until it collapsed. And how it collapsed, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. Um, we are still kind of in debate about that, but it certainly did collapse. And uh, this volcano was active until about, I would say about two uh, 200,000 years ago, uh, from about four, four and a half million years to 200,000 years ago. So it had a long lifetime and it produced a large sequence of ignimbrites and of course also intrusive rocks in the center of the island. Now I'd like to move now to the Teide National Park. It's uh, one of the most spectacular national parks in all of Spain and in all of Europe in fact. And uh, it's got um, close to 200 square kilometers. It was established in 1952 in the little map there, it's the red area. And uh, then there is kind of a, a transitional zone. It's this yellow area, and this is a protected area. You can walk around there. This is very nice. You even have roads. You're not restricted too much, but um, you're not allowed to sample unless you have permission. And you have to, of course, be careful about animals and things like that. And uh, you're not supposed to destroy anything or litter. Um, but um, it's also a tourist magnet. So a lot of people are there. and. Uh, 
it's also, um, yeah, how to put this, I know that some Lund students in previous years had some bad experience there about things being stolen. And two of my master students had their backpacks stolen in there as well, because everybody's looking at the spectacular geology, people are not paying attention to uh, some uh, not so nice people kind of. Yeah, anyway, uh, so uh, because of this attractiveness, it's, uh, it's got its, its very modern dangers as well. But uh, it actually attracts something like over 4 million visitors a year. Uh, well, that's pre-corona numbers. And uh, there's a little histogram there. In 2018, it had a record number of visitors, an all-time high of 4.3 million. So it's the biggest and most attractive um, site in the Canaries and likely in all of Spain, actually. So this is some of the highlights. You have the Las Cañadas Caldera March, and we talked a little bit about it. And then we have the Central Volcano. The Central Volcano has a cable car that goes up there to um, 3,500 meters from about a little over 2,000 meters. So you don't have to hike up there, but you can hike up there if you like. And uh, now they are thinking about building a restaurant there at 3,500 meters. And likely it's gonna be one of those Michelin or star restaurants. So you can have a very exclusive meal up there if you can afford it. And um, Teide itself sits in this um, uh, collapsed area of the Las Cañadas Caldera. And uh, the big argument is, is it a vertical or a lateral collapse? And I like to actually think there's evidence for both. I think the vertical collapse predates the lateral collapse. And if you had loads of vertical collapses, you likely destabilize the edifice and then you might have lateral collapses as a consequence of that. So personally, I don't think the dispute is quite as severe as some people like to make it out. Um, I think both is uh, um, um, building on each other. So, but um, here now, Tate and uh, Tate is sitting in the Ecot collapse and the Ecot collapse is likely this chunk of the caldera that's missing. Uh, towards the north that fell into the sea. But um, the uh, original shape of the Las Cañadas Caldera is likely made up of several vertical collapse basins that are a little older. We uh, did some dating on some of these intrusions that stick out and some of the alteration there, and they date back to over half a million years ago, while the cod collapse is only 200,000 years ago. So I think there was vertical collapse phenomena in the height of the Las Cañadas uh, era, and then um, at about 200,000 years, part of this edifice collapsed to the side and uh, produced um, a debris avalanche in the sea. So I showed this image before, the Las Cañadas volcano and uh, Teide volcano. So now I'd like to kind of uh, look a little bit more at the features inside the caldera. And uh, here, we have uh, some lava, some young lavas coming from the central system that filling up the caldera, but you can also see the old remnants of the Las Cañadas caldera, some of the intrusive material sticking out, and it's a beautiful cliff, and you can drive along the cliff and also hike along the cliff, and if you look at it from above, from Teide Volcano, this is how it looks, so you can actually see that the Las Cañadas caldera is made of several basins, and uh, these basins seem to overlap. And I think this may be a remnant of former vertical collapse basins that then uh, are still kind of providing some structural control for the current Las Cañadas caldera wall. But then in the foreground here, we have lavas from Teide and in the middle of the image, we have the um, uh, Montaña Blanca phonolite dome with these phonolite, these short stubby phonolite lavas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So here's some impressions of the Las Cañadas caldera. And um, it's, um, um, in my view, as I said, a vertical collapse caldera that has experienced a lateral collapse. And there is some remnants that stick up. And these were likely uh, areas in between some of the collapse basins. At least that's my interpretation, like the Roque del Garcia in the top right hand image. And uh, here we have uh, a little uh, kind of drawing I did a few years ago. I think we had several kind of vertical collapse basins in the top right, you can see that. And eventually the whole area was so destabilized that we had this lateral collapse to the side of the volcano. And um, some of these uh, remnants, these sticky out bits, they are from in between these vertical collapse areas. 
So that's my personal take on it. But uh, I know that uh, certainly some of the uh, more local geologists, they have very strong views about one or the other, and they don't like to see them mixed together. I personally feel uh, one can be a bit more flexible. To look at some of these remnants that stick out there, uh, here is one of these sites. Um, this is uh, uh, the tree of rock as it's locally known, and it actually gives you some stratigraphy from inside the old Las Canadas volcano. But sooner or later, this will fall over. It's very thin at the bottom. And um, this sits in between the uh, lowermost and the middle um, caldera basins. And uh, this is this remnant there. It's heavily altered, it's hydrothermally cooked, so it was certainly within some very active volcanic system. So here you have some overview and you see these very intense greenish and pinkish colors. And this is usually kind of mid temperature hydrothermal alteration, three, 400 degrees, loads of fluids passing through there. Likely there was fumaroles at the surface, so this was a very active volcanic system back then. And uh, here you have some outcrops, it's called Los Azulejos. The tiles, because they're so colorful, like Spanish uh, tiles, and um, it's a hydrothermal um, alteration phenomena that you see mainly along the caldera margin and in some of these remnants that stick out from the caldera floor. Here's a few more impressions, and here's uh, another one of the former PhD students posing on the left-hand side, and uh, this is one of the most colorful ones. And they have been locally used for wall paints and things like that, so the local people have made, made use of these uh, intensely colored rocks. But of course, today you're not allowed to quarry them anymore. This was in the old days. And uh, there you have these spectacular mixtures of pinks and turquoises and things like that. Very attractive colors, I find. And um, yeah, but the rock mass is not very stable. It's very crumbly. It's, it's really cooked through, if you will. So here's a few more impressions, and then you see the young lavas filling up the basin, and they're engulfing these old hydrothermally altered rocks, which makes for a beautiful geological scenario um, by, you know, having old rocks engulfed by younger ones. So it gives you a sense of the timing involved. And ultimately, if eruptions continue, many of these uh, sticking out hydrothermally altered rocks would actually be covered by young material. So here's uh, one impression from the center of the Las Canadas caldera with Teide in the background. And uh, here we have some young Pahoy Hoy type lava engulfing this uh, sticking out mass of the Rockes del Garcia. So a few words about um, a tree, the tree of rocks. And, uh, the tree of um, uh, the rock tree is um, uh, one of the most visited sites on the island. And uh, it's uh, giving us a stratigraphy of sedimentary and pyroclastic rocks and also of some intrusive rocks. The reason why it's there is actually because of two dikes. So there's two dikes that cut through this thing at the very top and they are very massive. So they are protecting the, uh, the rock tree from erosion at the top and uh, erosion is stronger at the softer base. So this is why it's so head heavy, if you will. And um, there has been a similar thing, the finger of God on Gran Canaria, and it uh, toppled over a few years ago. And it was a big thing. Uh, the local media even discussed whether they should put it back up and glue it back on. Uh, I think this is very yeah, silly. So we have to accept that uh, nature will just uh, do its thing and sooner or later it will fall over in some stormy night, I guess. But uh, it's uh, the most visited place, actually. And indeed, it is the most photographed place on Tenerife. So here's an uh, evening image by one of my former PhD students, Sebastian Wiesmeyer. He was big into photography and he did these beautiful images. And uh, here you have Teide and uh, the Tree of Rocks. So now Teide National Park, um, it's the centerpiece of uh, Tenerife in terms of geology. And uh, I'd like to kind of uh, talk a little bit about Teide now as well. And uh, Teide is a very young volcano, as I said. It's uh, also very tall and uh, it has, however, not had any uh, summit eruptions in quite some time, probably at least a thousand years. There has been eruptions on the periphery and on the rift zones, but uh, not in the center. The name Teide is likely coming from the original Guanxi language and um, the word Enchede uh, means hell. 
And indeed, uh, the Guanxi, uh, the Aboriginal population, they would have seen some of the big eruptions of Tadeus some 2000 years ago. And this is why some people believe that uh, the name uh, Tede Hell um, uh, has, has stuck. But Tede has been very friendly. It's been quite a calm volcano since at least the Spanish conquest. And the local population actually refers to Tede as Father Tede, being almost a protective figure. And uh, so the image of Tede certainly has changed over the last few thousand years and in different cultures. So here's an image of Tede above the clouds and, um, and then uh, just a few kind of beautiful impressions here. Here's Tede from different angles and um, it's um, a towering volcano, often snow covered, certainly in winter uh, because of the high elevation. And indeed there's a little cave close to the top. I, uh, I cut the image for time reasons, but there's a little cave and there you have snow and ice collecting. And in the old days, people were going up there and uh, bringing ice down to the uh, rich uh, neighborhoods in the uh, Orotava Valley. So even people 100 or 200 years ago could have ice cream uh, with ice from Tate. So, and uh, here's a few more and you see the dark lavas that come off Tater. That's the lavas negras. They uh, erupted in the medieval time prior to the Spanish conquest. And then we have this new peak that grew on top. This grew during the Lavas Negras eruption. So prior to this Lavas Negras eruption, Tede was likely a little bit flatter. This dome is uh, relatively young, only a little over a thousand years. And then we have the white colored rocks in front, that's Montaña Blanca. And the eruption age for Montaña Blanca is about 2000 years before present. This is likely one of these eruptions that uh, the uh, local Aboriginal population would have witnessed. And this is maybe where the term hell for Tede has come from in their language. But as I said, today um, it's got a very fatherly image and uh, even um, in uh, local economy, it plays a big role. Many product brands use Tede and uh, local brewery, which is very famous. There's two big breweries in the Canaries, one on Gran Canaria and one on uh, Tenerife. And they're in big competition with each other. And uh, the Tenerife brand stars the Tede volcano as uh, in its center logo. And uh, depending on which island you come from, you uh, have a different beer. And uh, of course, people from Tenerife would uh, tell you that the beer from Gran Canaria is no good and the other way around. So, but um, here now up to Tede. And uh, as I said, there's a cable car going up there. And uh, this is uh, actually quite tough because uh, you are making a lot of altitude very quickly. A lot of people end up with a big headache up there because of the quick altitude change. And uh, then um, you can uh, have a little walk around there. And as I said, they're thinking about building a, a restaurant up there now, which I think will be quite spectacular. To go up to the very summit, however, there is a ranger that will check whether you have a permit, you need to apply for a permit. So you are free to go up to this level where the cable car station is, but to go to the very summit, you need to have permission. And I've been up there and um, the um, summit crater, it was mined um, in the, particularly in the Spanish Civil War for sulfur in order to make explosives and uh, all sorts of things. So it's not an original kind of very original crater. It's a bit, yeah, partly filled up and partly destroyed, but there's still some fumarole activity. So here you have some image on the left uh, of the remnants of the old crater and on the right, you can see some of the sulfur crystals that uh, I found up there. And uh, on a lucky day, you have a little bit of fumarole activity. It's not very strong and it's not very hot. And uh, it seems to vary also with uh, kind of weather and with um, the air pressure and things like that. So it's not a, a super strong system. It's quite um, responsive to external factors, which uh, also highlights it's not that strong in itself. So here's a few more impressions from up there. Of course, there's monitoring equipment up there now. And um, if uh, Tede would wake up, we would realize that very quickly from all the monitoring stations up there. But so far it's been very quiet. There has been a little bit of unrest in 2004, uh, but likely this was only a small dike intrusion at depth, if at all. Some people argue it may have just been uh, explosions or collapses in some of the water tunnels. Well, hard to tell, but uh, it didn't manifest in any major form at the surface. So uh, here's a few more impressions of the fumaroles and uh, of the sulfur crystals we have 
on top of A. So as I said, the uh, very peak, uh, the cone on top, uh, that goes back to the uh, uh, Lavas Negras eruptions. And uh, there uh, we have to accept that uh, the volcano was a little flatter back prior to the Lavas Negras eruption. And you can kind of, kind of just about see that. So in the middle image here, there's a small reconstruction of the old Tede as it's called. And now we have this new kind of uh, pointy bit on top uh, that has grown inside the wider, probably much wider crater that was present in early medieval times. So now looking at this, you see that uh, the Caldera Basin is being filled up with quite a lot of eruptives from the Tade system and uh, Tade is very active and uh, uh, the Spanish colleagues have mapped this in quite some detail. So there's a whole string of lava flows that's filling up the collapsed basin, the Las, Caldeada, uh, Las Cañadas basin and uh, the red one in the center, that's the lavas negras. And uh, then there's loads of other eruptions. Most of them have been dated by now. So there's a good stratigraphy and you can see smaller eruptions come from uh, the rift zones. They are mainly basaltic. And then you have these more voluminous uh, felsic phonolytic eruptions in the center of the system. So here's just an image of uh, Tater and um, the dark ones that come down the steep flanks, that's the Lavas Negras. The Lavas Negras are phonolytic. So it's a phonolite lava. And here's the extent of the lavas negras. And uh, they have been dated at 1150 before present. So uh, early medieval times. And they were likely the last summit eruption. So I'm going to share some images with you because they look so spectacular. I can't help it. So here is the lavas negras building some levees on the lower flow, uh, on the lower slopes of the volcano. And well, they're called negras because they're very dark. They're really glassy. It's almost like obsidian in many places. And obsidian, uh, sorry, phonolite is often very light colored, but because it's so glassy, they look so dark. And uh, beautiful flow structures of the lavas negras. And it's very sharp material, so it's easy to hurt yourself. And here's a few kind of close up impressions of how they look. And uh, here you can really see the distinct lava flows that have covered some of these earlier Montaña Blanca pumices here in the left-hand side image. And some of these steep slopes gave rise to an intriguing phenomenon that's known as Tadis eggs. And here is uh, some of Tadis eggs. And um, there is my wife, uh, much younger than uh, today. Um, this is a few years ago. And uh, here you can see, I mean, the scale of some of these eggs are just enormous and uh, I was always very intrigued because they occur in all sizes. There's a former student here on the on the left with a much smaller version of Tater's eggs and uh, well it took me a while to figure this out and some help from my Spanish colleagues but uh, eventually the reality is these are bits from lava flows that start to roll down the steep slopes. They're like snowballs. They're actually made up of layers inside and if you look very carefully, you see how they build up in layers. You can just about see that in the center image there, there's individual layers that have accumulated. And the phenomenon is known from Hawaii. The top right image is from Hawaii. And there you can see that uh, being built up in layers and they stick to each other. So on the steep slopes, we have things falling down effectively and they might run over semi-liquid lava and then the lava sticks and that makes these potentially large faults. So they're not bombs as such, they're not flying through the air, they're actually rolling down the hill. <coughs> so, and uh, then uh, close to um, the Lava of Negras um, on um, the Northwestern side of um, Tede, you find Pico Viejo. It's called the Old Cone, but actually it's likely uh, much younger than most of the Pico uh, Tede system. And it's got its own little crater. So likely it is what some people would call a parasite vent. It's that lavas increasingly find it hard to go all the way up to Tate summit. And then they start to move laterally as in the little sketch in the top right hand side. And uh, then you get little cones starting to cluster around the central volcano. So here's an image of uh, Pico Viejo's crater and it's got its own little stratigraphy. There's uh, lava successions in there but uh, maybe that's getting too detailed now. 
And um, here's just another kind of aerial impression. It's got its own eruptive history. And Pico Viejo is known for these really runny, crystal rich, and particularly feldspar rich lavas, Pahoy Hoy lavas that have been running down for many, many kilometers and partly down to the shore even. So here's some examples. And um, it's also quite well known for um, uh, making lava tubes. And uh, some of these lava tubes are filled with lava and then you get uh, features like this, the stone rose, it's one of the protected sites just um, at the fringe of the national park. And this is um, uh, one of the eruptions from that era. And uh, this brings me on to talk a little bit about lava tubes as well, because uh, Tenerife is quite famous for it. So here we have uh, several spectacular lava tubes and uh, they tend to be connected with Pico Viejo eruptions. So the one here on the left is about um, um, several tens of thousand years old. So it's little chance of uh, uh, lavas coming down there, but um, this is a spectacular natural site and it's accessible for most parts for tourists. There are some protective measures because there's some uh, animals that live in these caves that uh, are not found anywhere else. So uh, you have to kind of wear little uh, sort of protective things like uh, there's an image of Juan Carlos and myself in one of the lava tubes. And you might just see we had to wear these head kind of covers like in an isotope lab in order to avoid that some of our organic debris would remain in there uh, so that we would not um, impact the local ecosystem too much. So here's a few more impressions of some of these lava tubes, spectacular, and they can be tens of kilometers long. And uh, yeah, I talked about ecosystems and uh, there is, uh, for example, this magic spider. I forgot its name, uh, apologies for that. But um, there's a similar spider outside and it's very colorful, but uh, the spider inside the lava tube has given up producing color. It found it useless because usually it's dark in lava tubes. So it's entirely black. And um, yeah, it's very dark in the lava tubes. So you don't think of it much, but then suddenly if you switch on your light, you find that there's a lot of spiders in the lava tube. I felt a little uncomfortable about it, I have to admit. Um, but uh, we also have these lava kind of drop stones here. Uh, like the one in the top right, when the head uh, face of a lava tube melts because of continued flow underneath, you actually get lava dripping down from the top. It's remelting of lava inside the lava tube. And there you get these, yeah, um, uh, stalactites of lava eff effectively. And that's quite spectacular to see. So, and at the surface, if you have lava tubes and they have some headlights, i.e. they have some um, kind of uh, skylights, uh, some 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 gaps in the lava, in the cover, in the crustal cover, you get what's known as hornitos. It's, um, it's a Mexican term. It's uh, a cone that forms on top of a lava flow that is actually partly covered. So you get the lava spurting out there and then it builds these little cones and you can have them in succession above some of these lava tubes there on uh, the flanks. And uh, this is part of uh, the present day or the recent system on Tenerife as well. So here's a nice impression of uh, two successive hornitos and likely there is a tube underneath. And um, I guess uh, sometimes there's old stories that you hear about uh, some people uh, breaking through a crust and falling into a lava tube. There's a story of an old granny that once fell into one of these kind of breaking surfaces with a lava tube underneath. Apparently the granny was fine afterwards. So she fell down five meters or so, but survived. And the lava tube was named after her in honor of her survival. So uh, um, it's not too dangerous, but of course it means that some of the ground may be unstable. The lava features can be spectacular. And uh, here's some examples from the Northwest uh, uh, Rift Zone system. And they make these levees. And in some cases they can actually solidify in the top part. And that's when you make the tubes. But in many cases, they're not solidified on the top. Then you get just these levee systems as in the central image here. But uh, the lava is quite runny, quite hot, and uh, it makes beautiful high hoi structures for many kind of, in many areas of the island. So, and um, here a few more lava impressions from uh, the central volcano. And I'll quickly kind of run through that. Here's a few more. And they form these steep levee systems on the 
uh, on the flanks of the volcano, and then they uh, form these lava deltas, if you like, on the shallowest part. We can see that here quite spectacularly inside the caldera, how lava responds to the topography. But I want to move a little bit now towards the central system and uh, how this works. And the central system, as I said, is dominantly phonolytic. And um, here we have a whole cluster, a peripheral cluster of phonolite domes and phonolite lava that has formed in the last few 10,000 years around Teide volcano, with Montaña Blanca, the unit in red, being the most prominent one. But several of the others have gone all the way to the sea. Some of this lava is very runny, so it must be pretty hot. And uh, here's a few impressions of these uh, phonolite domes and clusters from around uh, the periphery of Teide volcano. And here's just another one. And here's a few more. This is the really light colors that you see close to the volcano. And here's the Hara dome, very stubby phonolite lava flows in quick succession building up. And uh, here's one close up. So uh, these have formed large lava flows if they have the opportunity on steep surfaces to go all the way down to the coast. And here's a few of these lava flows marked coming from the periphery of Teide and also from what's nowadays Peak of Viejo. We argue that uh, some of these low density phonolites will not have an easy time to go all the way to the surface, uh, to the peak, and therefore they kind of uh, use a shortcut. They come out at the flanks and they produce flank eruptions uh, around the central Teide volcano. There are some beautiful examples here of um, um, some of these phonolite lava flows. And unlike water, which would always run down the hill, lava can actually solidify when it's running down the hill and it can freeze halfway on the slope. And here's a beautiful example here where um, um, the lava just hardened on the way down. If you don't have continuous pressure from uh, behind and if cooling is effective, then you get phenomena like that, that uh, lava can just stop even on mid slope. So, these have been dated and um, these peripheral uh, domes, they have formed in the last few tens of thousands of years. So this is a relatively young feature. And uh, this means that the Tata system is maturing and uh, it only started to grow about 200,000 years ago. And uh, now we're seeing that it's already grown so tall that it forms uh, these peripheral areas. And uh, people have been mapping this. You have uh, mainly basaltic rocks on the rift zones and uh, phonolytic rocks in the central part. This is consistent with what, we, um, what I've shown you for the uh, northeast rift zone, mainly basaltic rocks. So there seems to be some phenomena of uh, clustering and fractionation or differentiation in the center of the island. And uh, I had a PhD student looking at this a few years ago. And um, he sampled um, each of these different lavas and uh, occurrences. And here we have uh, the basaltic, uh, broadly basaltic rocks of the rift zone, the central phonolites. And then there's some intermediate compositions in the transition zone between these. And um, this was the sample suite that um, um, Sebastian, the student, uh, collected. And um, he was very interested in uh, how this works, this interaction between the central part and the rift zone. And um, here we have one of these uh, outcrops from the transition part where you have uh, basaltic rocks likely erupted from the rift zone and phonolytic pumices that likely come from the central every, um, uh, edifice. This is not a mixed eruption per se. This is more likely that material came from different sites but was just superimposed on each other. So this is really the transition between the central complex and the rift zone, giving rise to these uh, spectacular layered kind of structures. And uh, locally it's known as la tarta, the, uh, the, the, the cake. So it's a layer cake structure made up of different eruptions actually, and not necessarily a mixed eruption in this particular case. So Sebastian Wiesmeyer's PhD kind of looked at all of these. And uh, here we have the primitive, the mafic eruptions in uh, yellow, the intermediate ones in orange, and uh, in red, the really evolved phonolytic ones. And so we have a wide spectrum, but um, it's kind of intriguing that it's not a continuous spectrum. 
it looks like that uh, there's a gap in between. We would call this a bimodal differentiation series. So it seems that it's not a continuous fractionation series. Something else is going on. And also the phonolites, they don't follow the trend. They actually have an oblique trend. And this is often associated with some sort of recycling inside the island. And this was the hypothesis that um, uh, was tested in Wiesmeyer et al. And um, let's see whether we can go a little further here. Oops. So yes, when we look at the eruptive volumes, here we have in uh, yellow the basaltic ones and then uh, the phonolytic ones in red. And the eruption volumes are a lot bigger for the phonolites. And if you think of Bowen's fractional crystallization series, you would actually think that you get very little evolved rock like rhyolite from a lot of basalt. Usually it's about 10% that you have left. It's a distillation process. And this is exactly the reverse on Tenerife here. So the cumulative eruptive volume here uh, is actually a lot more for the phonolites than it is for the primitive rocks. So Sebastian was quite uh, happy to propose that we must be recycling, remelting some of the older Las Canadas felsic rocks in the interior of the island. And uh, he tried to test this isotopically. And so here is the kind of map again. This is the different rocks he sampled for that. And this was the intermediate rocks, which he postulated were mainly mixed rocks and they were not actually a fractionation product. And then here we have the phonolites only in the center, really concentrated in the center of the system. The maximum heat flux area, if you will, where his argument is that remelting was actually quite likely because some of these older rocks should melt at reasonably low temperatures, seven, 800 degrees, while some of these phonolites would come up at a thousand degrees. So uh, remelting seems to be something that is possible. So it's this central part here, and he did a lot of geochemistry. I'm gonna whiff through that. Don't wanna to be too detailed here, but here's some multi-element variation plots. And in yellow, the primitive rocks from the rift zone. In uh, orange, the intermediate rocks. And then we have the felsic rocks, and they are quite spiky here. They have some real differences. And there is some negative uh, troughs for strontium and barium, and you could argue this comes from feldspar fractionation, but you could also make the argument this comes from partial assimilation of older rocks where you leave feldspar in the residue. So the multi-element variation plots might not give a full answer, but he did some isotopes, and here we have strontium isotopes with distance to Tate, and the color scheme is the same. The red ones are the phonolites, and the phonolites seem to have higher strontium, and that might actually hint at some remelting. The argument is that the old rocks were hydrothermally altered. I've shown you some evidence for hydrothermally altered rocks in the interior of the Las Canadas volcano. And if you were to melt material like this, you could actually produce different isotopes. So that was the proposal that we kind of put up. And here's some lead isotopes. And um, I don't, again, want to go into detail, but the color code is the same. And while the basaltic rocks show a bit of a spread, the red phonolytic rocks, they're quite clustery. They're quite well defined and they overlap with these kind of green rocks, which are previous uh, deposits from Tenerife. That's the Diego Hernandez formation, which is the Bandas del Sur ignimbrites. So a good argument could be made that some of these were recycled. Sediments plot far off to the left and we don't see any evidence for sediments Atlantic sediments involved. So here is a plot where we can build this up a little bit. Atlantic sediments or Fuerteventura sediments, they seem to have very little effect. And there seem to be several trends here in the phonolites and the rift zone rocks. And it's uh, really the old shield volcanoes, the central one, and um, the old Las Canadas rocks that overlap here. So uh, an argument was put forward that uh, an element of recycling gives rise to the present day phonolite concentration in the center of the island. And uh, some of the older rocks seem to overlap here. So this was uh, the main thesis there. And here is a close up of this kind of concept. And exactly what of the old rocks was recycled, I guess one can debate that, but some element of recycling seems to be the case. And um, here is a trace element ratio plot 
And again, the color code is the same for the primitive, the transitional, and the evolved drugs. This is from Sebastian Wiesmeyer's thesis. And uh, then we have the older um, Diego Hernandez Ignium Brights, that's a subunit of the Las Canadas volcano, and they overlap mainly with the evolved rocks. So this is a reasonable argument for this. He went to quite some length to test this. He did uh, assimilation and fractionation modeling, energy constraint, um, EC, AFC models, and um, he thinks he can reproduce these phonolites by remelting some of these older cyanitic and phonolytic compositions, and he can melt them at reasonable temperatures. So uh, the large volume of these phonolites in the center may be a function of the old volcano rather than being a classic fractional crystallization scenario. So this implies that we have a large felsic system in the center of the island, and it's so large and fed by these incoming small basaltic batches that it partly remelts the surrounding. While on the rift zones, we don't store magma very much. We really have it coming up in small monogenetic eruptions, and that explains the difference between the central system and the rift zones reasonably well. And it also explains these larger volume eruptions in the center compared to the small volume eruptions on the rift zone. So for the last few minutes, um, I really want to kind of now move towards the historical eruptions, and I want to give you a short overview of the historical eruptions. We're almost through, so here's kind of just the closing chapter of Tenerife's geological history. And this is a record of the historical eruptions and um, different maps giving different colors, but obviously the uh, sticking out areas, that's the historical eruptions. There is the 1492 one that was described by Columbus. There is um, the 1704, 1705 eruption at uh, Siete Fuentes, at Fasnia and Arafo. It had three vents in quick succession, so it was likely a classic rift eruption with a big dike feeding all of them in quick succession. And then there was the Garachico eruption in 1706, which had some unfortunate economic consequences, and I'll mention this briefly. And there was one on the flank of um, Pico Viejo inside the caldera, the Chahora eruption in 1798. So here, the 1704-1705 uh, eruption it happened over Christmas, and um, it had three vents, as I said. One of them was um, um, just at the margin of the caldera, the other one a little further out, and then the Arafo volcano grew inside the former landslide scar of Guima. And the landslide scar of Guima is between 800 and 500,000 years old, and it's still being filled up with active eruptions. And likely there was a dike system feeding magma laterally. The uh, one closer to the center is the oldest vent, and the other ones were successively younger, broadly speaking. And um, here you can see it in an aerial view. Um, there's this nested little uh, cinder cone in the Guima um, collapse scar, and it produced some darker lavas that were flowing down, but it wasn't going all the way. It was uh, stopping a little bit before reaching the sea, to my understanding. And um, this um, 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 is uh, one of these kind of um, fascinating places because you can see there's a road crisscrossing it. So you can actually look at the lava, how it changes with progressive uh, movement down the hill. So this is uh, one of the uh, eruptive vents up on the hill from the 1704 eruptions. And there it's a syntacone. There was a few small lava flows coming off, but they were, didn't go very far. And here's another one. And I think one of the videos I showed you, a very bumpy video because it's only a dirt track, but then I was driving by some of these vents and um, I got permission to take a sample. So currently we're working with a sample from this. I have a master student there. And um, well, let's see what we find out. So then the 1706 eruption, this was the economically very unfortunate eruption. Nobody died in the eruption, but what happened is uh, we had a rift zone eruption that was producing lava that went all the way down to the sea. And it just happened to fill the harbor basin of Garachico. There's an oil painting here on the right that depicts this big drama. And this was the main harbor basin for the American sea traffic. So uh, a lot of the big ships came in there and they were able to turn inside the harbor basin. 
And once the lava went into the harbor basin, this was no longer possible. So this was closed as a major seaport. And then initially um, the seaport was shifted to Las Americas um, on the uh, southwestern side of the island. But even that turned out too uh, weather prune. And then they moved to uh, Santa Cruz in the northeast of the island. And that's the active harbor to the present day. So the eruptions actually shifted the infrastructure of the island and uh, basically the culture and economy quite dramatically, having uh, terminated uh, the sea traffic from this particular site. So here is Garachico Harbor and you can just see the dark rocks in the harbor basin and uh, um, they were kind of filling this up. So, but then a few words about the more recent ones. In 1909, there was a small eruption up in the uh, rift zone. And here's a few photos on the right-hand side. This was the early days of photography. So they may be not the sharpest, but you can actually see that um, this was a, a bit of a tourist attraction at the time. People flocked there actually quite close. I'm quite surprised. And uh, the authorities uh, didn't really restrict this very much. So uh, there's a lot of stories of people going there with their mules and having picnics there and things like that. So this was the 1909 event. And uh, the 1492 event, um, there is no accounts from it, but uh, we know that um, Columbus witnessed the eruption and uh, the Boca Cangrejo event. And uh, here in the top right is the carbon dating and uh, it restricts it to this time interval when uh, uh, Columbus passed. So there's a good reasonable degree of confidence that the eruption of 1492 has been identified in the Boca Cangrejo eruptive vent and lava flow. So then a uh, few words about the 1705 one. It uh, formed on the steep flank of uh, Pico Viejo and uh, here you see the vents of it and uh, again steep levees um, on the flank and then further down on the shallow part it um, uh, starts to make this lava delta but it's all inside the caldera and the eruption did not actually leave the caldera it was constrained by the caldera wall so uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that means that the caldera will need quite some time to fill up completely and it's uh, projected that it needs to fill up at least another 20 meters before the first lavas from inside the caldera would actually manage to go outside. So here's a close-up of the 1705 vents and uh, likely there was a fissure involved as well. There seems to be a small alignment and uh, this is given by the arrows here and uh, this is likely also a dike that was feeding it underneath and you can look inside the kind of little crater of the vent and uh, well there's a human there for scale. When you stand there it's not quite so little but um, I mean, on the overall scale of Tenerife, it's comparatively small. Now, a few kind of uh, last words about uh, the beauty of Tenerife. Um, the Lanzarote um, Timanfaya National Park is very restrictive. You cannot really walk around freely. You have to kind of be in a guided bus tour and um, you cannot really do these things on your own. The beauty about Tenerife is you can walk around there on your own. There is even roads you can drive there on your own. And here's some of these hiking routes that uh, you can do and you can look at all of these eruptions, making this a spectacular site for geologists as well as natural um, uh, enthusiasts, i.e. people who just enjoy nature and the idea of volcanoes. And uh, this, as I said, makes uh, Teide and uh, Teide National Park one of the most successful national parks in Europe. And uh, here's just a, a blog that I, I clipped. And uh, here it reports that uh, record visitors to Spain's national parks with Teide being the absolute most favorite one in uh, that particular year, I think that was 2017. So hopefully that um, uh, will come back after Corona because the island's economy is largely dependent on that. So this brings me on to say, if you like to read more, there's a few books that I've been involved in. I sent one as a PDF to Ulf, and maybe you can um, uh, pressure him to get a copy of that. And um, then uh, I think you also have the Tenerife chapter of the other book. 
And uh, there I described a lot of these sites that I've shown you today, and also some of the hiking tours that you may want to do if you have a chance to go there. And that closes my kind of second part of the lecture. And I'd like to say thank you for sticking with me for these two hours. And I would suggest we have a short break and uh, then I uh, would be quite happy to answer some questions if that sounds okay.